Welcome back to the Buddhist Bookshelf YouTube channel. Today, we will resume our reading of The Sorrowless Flower, authored by Ngoc Tran, known as Dharma Name Thien Phuc, and this is episode number 25. 336. Different Kinds of Supernatural Powers. Supernatural or magical powers that are part of Abhijna. It refers to the power to manifest multiple forms of oneself or to transform oneself into another shape, to become invisible, to pass through valid things, to walk on water or fire, to touch the sun and moon, and to scale the highest heaven. These abilities are byproducts of meditation, concentration and contemplation practices. However, exhibiting or exploiting these powers is a violation of monastic discipline and pretending to possess such powers is grounds for dismissal from the Sangha. According to the Sutra in 42 sections, Chapter 13, Asramana asked the Buddha, What are the causes and conditions by which one come to know past lives, and also by which one's understanding enables one to attain the way? The Buddha said, By purifying the mind and guarding the will, your understanding can achieve, attain, the way. Just as when you polish a mirror, the dust vanishes and brightness remains, so, too, if you cut off and do not seek desires, you can then know past lives. Abhijna is a Sanskrit term for higher knowledge. Super-knowledge are modes of insight attained by the practice of dhyana. Super-knowledge or supernatural powers, a high state of consciousness when six spiritual powers have been developed, abilities possesses by a Buddha, Bodhisattva or Arat. These are six supernatural abilities that are believed in traditional Buddhist meditation theory to result from the practice of meditation. 1. Magical powers, Rudai, such as levitation, or divine ability to be at anywhere at any time, 2. The divine ear, Divyasratra, or Claradians, which can perceive all human and divine voices, 3. The ability to know others' minds, Parasitajnana. 4. The divine eye. Divyakaxis, or clairvoyance, which can see all things in the universe, including the cycles of births and deaths of all beings. 5. The ability to recall the details of former lives, Pravanavasamusmudi, or divine perception of the thoughts of other beings, recollection of previous existences. 6. Knowledge of the extinction of defilements, Asravak Sayavijnana. Or knowledge concerning the extinction of one's own impurity and passions. The first five are classified as mundane abilities, while the sixth is a supramundane ability that results from completion of training in insight meditation. Miracle powers include knowing, skillful, clever, understanding, conversant with, remembrance, recollection. Miracles mean ubiquitous supernatural power, psychic power, high powers, supernormal knowledges, or supernowledge. Miraculous powers are what the Western religious imagination would regard as miraculous or supernatural, attainable only through penetrating insight, as seen in the two Amitabha Sutras as inconceivable. According to Buddha's tradition, there are three aspects of the omniscience of Buddha. Knowledge of future karma, knowledge of past karma, and knowledge of present illusion and liberation. Besides, there are five kinds of supernatural powers. First, supernatural powers of bodhisattvas through their insight into truth. Second, supernatural powers of arats through their mental concentration. Third, supernatural or magical powers dependent on drugs, charms, incantations, etc. Fourth, reward of karma powers of transformation possessed by divas, nagas, etc. Fifth, magical powers of goblins, satyrs, etc. There are still five other supernatural powers or five mystical powers. First, seeing to any distance, ability to see without hindrances. Ability to see beings vanishing and reappearing, low and noble ones, beautiful and ugly ones, seeing beings are reappearing according to their deeds, karma. Diva vision, instantaneous view of anything anywhere in the form realm. Second, diva hearing, ability to hear sound both heavenly and human far and near, ability to hear any sound anywhere. Third, penetrating men's thoughts, ability to know the thoughts of all other minds, knowledge of the minds of all others. Ability to know the minds of other beings by penetrating them with one's own mind. This person knows the greedy mind, hate mind and deluded mind, 
shrunken and distracted mind, developed mind and free mind of others or vice versa. 4. Knowing their state and antecedents, knowledge of all former existence or transmigrations of self and others, ability to remember former existences, may be from one to five or even to hundred or thousand births. 5. Magical powers or taking any form at will, ability to be anywhere or do anything at will. Ability to pass through walls and mountains, just as if through the air. Ability to walk on the water without sinking, just as if on the earth. Furthermore, there are six magical penetrations, six supernoleges, or six supernatural or universal powers acquired by a Buddha, also by an Arat through the fourth degree of dhyana. First, Deva I or Divine Sight, which is instantaneous view of anything anywhere in the form realm. Power to see what one wills to see anywhere. Seeing to any distance. Ability to see without hindrances. The Deva I also has the ability to see beings vanishing and reappearing, low and noble ones, beautiful and ugly ones, seeing beings are reappearing according to their deeds, karma. Second, Deva Ear or Divine Hearing, clairaudience or penetration of the heavenly ear, which has the ability to hear all sounds, ability to hear any sound anywhere or hearing to any distance. Power to hear and understand all languages. The Deva Ear also has the ability to hear sound both heavenly and human, far and near. Third, mental telepathy, penetration into others' minds or thoughts, or the ability to know the thoughts of others or power to read thoughts or knowledge of the minds of all living beings. Ability, power, to know the thoughts of all other minds which enlightened beings have to a greater or lesser extent depending on their spiritual achievements. Mental telepathy, penetrating men's thoughts, also has the ability to know the minds of other beings by penetrating them with one's own mind. This person knows the greedy mind, hate mind and deluded mind, shrunken and distracted mind, developed mind and free mind of others or vice versa. Fourth, psychic travel, penetration of spiritual fulfillment or fulfillment of the spirit, or the ability, power, to be anywhere and to do anything at will, or power to appear at will in any place, and to have absolute freedom to do anything. Psychic travel also has the ability to take any form at will. Ability to pass through walls and mountains, just as if through the air or the ability to walk on the water without sinking, just as if on the earth. Fifth, knowledge of past and future of self and others or ability to penetrate into past and future lives of self and others, knowledge of all forms of former existences of self and others. Knowledge of past and future of self and others also means knowing their state and antecedents. Ability to remember former existences may be from one to five or even to hundred or thousand births. Sixth, ability to end contamination or power to deliver of the mind from all passions. Penetration of the exhaustion, extinction, of outflows. Ability to extinct all cankers, afflictions, in this very life, extinction of cankers through wisdom. Ability to end contamination also means supernatural consciousness of the waning of vicious propensities and the deliverance of mind from passions or insight into the ending of the stream of transmigration or the ability to extinct all cankers, afflictions, in this very life, extinction of cankers through wisdom. There are ten supernatural, ubiquitous powers. Knowing all previous transmigrations, diva hearing, knowing the minds of others, diva vision, showing diva powers, manifesting many bodies or forms, being anywhere instantly, power of bringing glory to one's domain, manifesting a body of transformation, power to end evil and transmigration. According to the Avadamsaka Sutra, the Buddha has ten spiritual powers. He can achieve all these wonders by merely entering into a certain samadhi. First, the sustaining and inspiring power which is given to the bodhisattva to achieve the aim of his life. Second, the power of working miracles. Third, the power of ruling. Fourth, the power of original vow. Fifth, the power of goodness practiced in his former lives. Sixth, the power of receiving good friends. Seventh, the power of pure faith and knowledge. Eighth, the power of attaining a highly illuminating faith. Ninth, the power of purifying the thought of the bodhisattva. Tenth, the power of earnestly walking towards all knowledge and original vows.
According to the Flower Adornment Sutra, Chapter 38, there are ten kinds of unimpeded function relating to spiritual capacities. Enlightening beings who abide by these can penetrate all Buddha teachings. First, show the bodies of all worlds in one body. Second, in the audience of one Buddha they hear the teaching spoken in the assemblies of all Buddhas. Third, in the mind and thoughts of one sentient being they accomplish inexpressible unsurpassed enlightenment and open the minds of all sentient beings. Fourth, with one voice they manifest the different sounds of speech of all worlds and enable sentient beings each to attain understanding. Fifth, in a single moment they show the various differences in results of actions of all ages of the entire past, causing sentient beings all to know and see. Sixth, in one atom appears Buddha land with boundless adornment. Seventh, cause all worlds to be fully adorned. Eighth, penetrate all pasts, presents and futures. Ninth, emanate the great light of truth and show the enlightenment of all Buddhas and the acts and aspirations of sentient beings. Tenth, enlightening beings protect. All living beings, saints, individual illuminates, enlightening beings, the ten powers of enlightenment, and the roots of goodness of enlightening beings. To conclude on the psychic powers, the Buddha taught. There are three types of psychic powers. One is the power to fly in the air and dive into the earth, or to perform other superhuman performances. The second is the power to read other people's minds. They can. Look into the eyes of the person and tell what the person is thinking. People can be very impressed with them. But the third psychic power, the power of instruction, whereby one can tell other people what is right and what is wrong, what is good and what is bad. This is unwholesome, unskillful, not conducive to your welfare or that of others. They are able to tell people what to abandon and what to follow or to practice or to cultivate wholesome actions. This power to guide another person on the right path is the most important psychic power. This is the best psychic power of them all. 337. Without leakage. No leakage means no drip. No leakage also means without afflictions, or what is outside of the passion stream, passionless, or a state without emotional distress. The unconditioned also means what is outside the stream of transmigratory suffering or away from the downflow into lower forms of rebirth. Unconditioned merits and virtues are the main causes of liberation from birth and death. No leakage is the state in which things are as they are. Whatever is in the stream of births and deaths. Even conditioned merits and virtues lead to rebirth within samsara. We have been swimming in the stream of outflows for so many eons, now if we wish to get out of it, we have no choice but swimming against that stream. To be without outflows is like a bottle that does not leak. For human beings, people without outflows means they are devoid of all bad habits and faults. They are not greedy for wealth, sex, fame, or profit. However, sincere Buddhists should not misunderstand the differences between greed and necessities. Remember, eating, drinking, sleeping, and resting, etc. will become outflows only if we overindulge in them. Sincere Buddhists should only eat, drink, sleep, and rest moderately, so that we can maintain our health for cultivation, that's enough. On the other hand, when we eat, we eat too much, or we try to select only delicious dishes for our meal, then we will have an outflow. 338. Self-vow ordination. In the formal discipline, there should be a private tutor, a ceremonial teacher, and some other senior monks as witnesses. An ordination should be carried through by a committee or an order of Sangha. When the article of a disciplinary code is read, the recipient makes a vow of obeisance by repeating the code of discipline. However, in some cases when such formal requirement cannot be fulfilled, one is as the self-vow discipline. According to the Brahma Jala Sutra, in some special situations, self-vow ordination is permitted. In some places, one cannot obtain the proper instructor in discipline, one can accept the precepts by self-vow. This is a kind of bodhisattva ordination. In Japan in the 13th century, Aisen Daishi taught a new movement of self-vow discipline. This was a reformed doctrine, called the Reformed or New Ritsu or Reformed Disciplinary School. There are three kinds of obtaining the commandments. 
First, to obtain the commandments, or to attain to the understanding and performance of the moral law. Second, to obtain ordination in a ceremony. Or to receive ceremonial ordination as a monk. Third, self-ordination, or to self-vow to keep the precepts. To make the vows and undertake the commandments oneself before the image of a Buddha, self-ordination when unable to obtain ordination from the ordained, however, the person must see auspicious marks, usually in dreams. In the formal discipline, there should be a private tutor, a ceremonial teacher, and some other senior monks as witnesses. 339. Five Factors of Endeavor. According to the Sanjiti Sutta in the Long Discourses of the Buddha, there are five factors of endeavor. First, a cultivator must have trust in the enlightenment of the Tathagata. Here a monk has faith, trusting in the enlightenment of the Tathagata. Thus this blessed Lord is an arahant, a fully enlightened Buddha, perfected in knowledge and conduct, a welfarer, knower of the world, unequal trainer of men to be tamed, teacher of gods and humans, a Buddha, a blessed Lord. Second, one must have good health, must be in a suitable place, and in a moderate temperature. He is in good health, suffers little distress sickness, having a good digestion that is neither too cold nor too hot, but of a middling temperature suitable for exertion. Third, a cultivator must be honest to everyone. He is not fraudulent or deceitful, showing himself as he really is to his teacher or to the wise among his companion in the holy life. Fourth, a cultivator must be diligent in cultivation. He keeps his energy constantly stirred up for abandoning unwholesome states and arousing wholesome states, and is steadfast, firm in advancing and persisting in wholesome states. Fifth, a cultivator must have a wisdom in cultivation. He is a man of wisdom, endowed with wisdom concerning rising and cessation, with the Aryan penetration that leads to the complete destruction of suffering. 340. Five Kinds of Deviant Livelihood. Five Improper Ways of Gaining a Livelihood for a Monk or Five Kinds of Deviant Livelihood. First, changing his appearance theatrically or displaying an unusual appearance. Second, advertise his own power of virtue or using low voice in order to appear awesome. Third, fortune telling or performing divination and fortune telling. Fourth, hectoring and bullying. Fifth, praising the generosity of another to induce the hearer to bestow presents. 341. The Triple Jewel. The foundation of Buddhism is the three treasures, without trust in which and reverence for there can be no Buddhist religious life. There are three kinds of Taratna, three treasures. The Triple Jewel was defined in many different ways. First, the unified or one body three treasures. The Virakana Buddha, representing the realization of the world of emptiness, of Buddha nature, of unconditioned equality. The Dharma that is the law of beginningless and endless becoming, to which all phenomena are subject according to causes and conditions. The harmonious fusion of the preceding two, which constitutes total reality as experienced by the enlightened. The three treasures are mutually related and interdependent. One unrealized in the unified three treasures can neither comprehend in depth the import of Sakyamuni Buddha's enlightenment, nor appreciate the infinite preciousness of his teachings, nor cherish as living images and pictures of Buddhas. Again, the unified three treasures would be unknown had not it been made manifest by Sakyamuni in his own body and mind, and the way to its realization expounded by him. Lastly, Without enlightened followers of the Buddha's way in our own time to inspire and lead others along this path to self-realization, the unified three treasures would be a remote ideal, the saga of Sakyamuni's life desiccated history, and the Buddha's words lifeless abstractions. More, as each of us embodies the unified three treasures, the foundation of the three treasures is none other than one's own self. Second, the manifested three treasures. The Buddha is the historic Buddha Sakyamuni, who through his perfect enlightenment, realized in himself the truth of the unified three treasures. The Dharma, which comprises the spoken words and sermons of Sakyamuni Buddha, wherein he elucidated the significance of the unified three treasures and the way to its realization.
The Sangha Sakyamuni Buddha's disciples, including the immediate disciples of the Buddha Sakyamuni and other followers of his day who heard, believed, and made real in their own bodies the unified three treasures that he taught. An assembly of monks, an order of the monks, or a company of at least three monks. Sangha is a Sanskrit term for community. The community of Buddhists. In an narrow sense, the term can be used just to refer to monks, bhiksu, and nuns, bhiksuni. However, in a wider sense, Sangha means four classes of disciples monks, nuns, upasaka, and upasaka. Laymen, upasaka, and laywomen, upasaka, who have taken the five vows of the Pankasila, fivefold ethics. All four groups are required formally to adopt a set of rules and regulations. Monastics are bound to 250 and 348 vows, however, the actual number varies between different Vinaya traditions. An important prerequisite for entry into any of the four categories is an initial commitment to practice of the Dharma, which is generally expressed by taking refuge in the three jewels. Buddha, Dharma, Sangha. The supremely enlightened being includes the iconography of Buddhas which have come down to us. The teaching imparted by the Buddha. All written sermons and discourses of Buddhas, that is, fully enlightened beings, as found in the sutras and other Buddhist texts still extant. The congregation of monks and nuns are genuine Dharma followers. Sangha consists of contemporary disciples who practice and realize the saving truth of the unified three treasures that was first revealed by Sakyamuni Buddha. The first jewel is the Buddha. The Buddha is the person who has achieved the enlightenment that leads to release from the cycle of birth and death and has thereby attained complete liberation. The word Buddha is not a proper name, but a title meaning enlightened one or awakened one. Prince Siddhartha was not born to be called Buddha. He was not born enlightened, nor did he receive the grace of any supernatural being, however, efforts after efforts, he became enlightened. It is obvious to Buddhists who believe in reincarnation that the Buddha did not come into the world for the first time. Like everyone else, he had undergone many births and deaths, had experienced the world as an animal, as a man, and as a god. During many rebirths, he would have shared the common fate of all that lives. A spiritual perfection like that of a Buddha cannot be the result of just one life. It must mature slowly throughout many ages and eons. However, after his enlightenment, the Buddha confirmed that any beings who sincerely try can also be freed from all clingings and become enlightened as the Buddha. All Buddhists should be aware that the Buddha was not a god or any kind of supernatural being, supreme deity nor was he a savior or creator who rescues sentient beings by taking upon himself the burden of their sins. Like us, he was born a man. The difference between the Buddha and an ordinary man is simply that the former has awakened to his Buddha nature, while the latter is still deluded about it. However, the Buddha nature is equally present in all beings. According to Tao Cho, 562-645, one of the foremost devotees of the Pure Land School, in his Book of Peace and Happiness, one of the principal sources of the Pure Land Doctrine. All the Buddhas save sentient beings in four ways. First, by oral teaching such recorded in the twelve divisions of Buddhist literature, second, by their physical features of supernatural beauty, third, by their wonderful powers and virtues and transformations, and fourth, by recitating of their names, which when uttered by beings, will remove obstacles and result their rebirth in the presence of the Buddha. The second jewel is the Dharma. Dharma is a very troublesome word to handle properly, and yet at the same time it is one of the most important and essential technical terms in Buddhism. First, etymologically, it comes from the Sanskrit root dry means to hold, to bear, or to exist. There seems always to be something of the idea of enduring also going along with it. The most common and most important meaning of Dharma in Buddhism is truth law religion. Secondly, it is used in the sense of existence being object or thing. Thirdly, it is synonymous with virtue righteousness or norm not only in the ethical sense, but in the intellectual one also. Fourthly, it is occasionally used in a most comprehensive way including all the senses mentioned above. 
in this case, we'd better leave the original untranslated rather than to seek for an equivalent in a foreign language. Besides, Dharma also means the cosmic law which is underlying our world. According to Buddhism, this is the law of karmically determined rebirth. Dharmas are all phenomena, things and manifestation of reality. All phenomena are subject to the law of causation, and this fundamental truth comprises the core of the Buddha's teaching. In Buddhism, Dharma means the teaching of the Buddha, understanding and loving. The way of understanding and love taught by the Buddha. The Buddha says. He who sees the Dharma sees me. All things are divided into two classes. Physical and mental, that which has substance and resistance is physical, that which is devoid of these is mental, the root of all phenomena is mind. The doctrines of Buddhism, norms of behavior and ethical rules including Pitaka, Vinaya and Sila. According to Prof. Jinjiro Takakusu in the Essentials of Buddhist Philosophy, the word Dharma has five meanings. First, the Dharma would mean that which is held to or the ideal, if we limit its meaning to mental affairs only. This ideal will be different in scope as conceived by different individuals. In the case of the Buddha it will be perfect enlightenment or perfect wisdom, body. Secondly, the ideal as expressed in words will be his sermon, dialogue, teaching, doctrine. Thirdly, the ideal is set forth for his pupils as the rule, discipline, precept, morality. Fourthly, the ideal to be realized will be the principle, theory, truth, reason, nature, law, condition. Fifthly, the ideal is realized in a general sense will be reality, fact, thing, element, created and not created, mind and matter, idea and phenomenon. According to the Madhyamakas, Dharma is a Pradian word in Buddhism. In the broadest sense it means an impersonal spiritual energy behind and in everything. There are four important senses in which this word has been used in Buddhist philosophy and religion. First, Dharma in the sense of one ultimate reality. It is both transcendent and imminent to the world, and also the governing law within it. Secondly, Dharma in the sense of scripture, doctrine, religion, as the Buddhist Dharma. Thirdly, Dharma in the sense of righteousness, virtue, and piety. Fourthly, Dharma in the sense of elements of existence. In this sense, it is generally used in plural. According to the meaning of Dharma in Sanskrit, Dharma is a very troublesome word to handle properly, and yet at the same time it is one of the most important and essential technical terms in Buddhism. Dharma has many meanings. A term derived from the Sanskrit root dhr which means to hold or to bear, there seems always to be something of the idea of enduring also going along with it. Originally, it means the cosmic law which underlying our world, above all, the law of karmically determined rebirth. The teaching of the Buddha, who recognized and regulated this law. In fact, Dharma, universal truth, existed before the birth of the historical Buddha, who is no more than a manifestation of it. Today, Dharma is most commonly used to refer to Buddhist doctrine and practice. Dharma is also one of the three jewels on which Buddhists rely for the attainment of liberation, the other jewels are the Buddha and the Sangha. Besides, the term Dharma also means the teaching of the Buddhas which carry or hold the truth. The way of understanding and love taught by the Buddha doctrine. The Buddha taught the Dharma to help us escape the sufferings and afflictions caused by daily life, and to prevent us from degrading human dignity and descending into evil paths such as hells, hungry ghosts, and animals, etc. The Dharma is like a raft that gives us something to hang on to as we eliminate our attachments, which cause us to suffer and be stuck on this shore of birth and death. The Buddha's Dharma refers to the methods of inward illumination, it takes us across the sea of our afflictions to the other shore, Nirvana. Once we get there, even the Buddha's Dharma should be relinquished. The Dharma is not an extraordinary law created by or given by anyone. According to the Buddha, our body itself is Dharma, our mind itself is Dharma, the whole universe is Dharma. By understanding the nature of our physical body, the nature of our mind, and worldly conditions, we realize the Dharma. The Dharma that is the law of beginningless and endless becoming, to which all phenomena are subject according to causes and conditions. The Dharma, which comprises the spoken words and sermons of Sakyamuni Buddha, 
wherein he elucidated the significance of the unified three treasures and the way to its realization. The Dharma, the teaching imparted by the Buddha. All written sermons and discourses of Buddhas, that is, fully enlightened beings, as found in the sutras and other Buddhist texts still extant. According to the Prajnaparamita Heart Sutra, the basic characteristic of all dharmas is not arising, not ceasing, not defiled, not immaculate, not increasing, not decreasing. The Buddha says. He who sees the dharma sees me. The third jewel is the Sangha. Sangha is a Sanskrit term for community. The community of Buddhists. In a narrow sense, the term can be used just to refer to monks, bhiksu, and nuns, bhiksuni. However, in a wider sense, Sangha means four classes of disciples, monks, nuns, upasaka and upasaka. Lay men, upasaka, and lay women, upasaka, who have taken the five vows of the Pankasila, fivefold ethics. All four groups are required formally to adopt a set of rules and regulations. Monastics are bound to 250 and 348 vows, however, the actual number varies between different Vinaya traditions. An important prerequisite for entry into any of the four categories is an initial commitment to practice of the Dharma, which is generally expressed by taking refuge in the three jewels. Buddha, Dharma, Samgha. The Sangha means the congregation of monks and nuns or genuine Dharma followers. Sangha consists of contemporary disciples who practice and realize the saving truth of the unified three treasures that was first revealed by Sakyamuni Buddha. Sangha is a Sanskrit term means the monastic community as a whole. Sangha also means a harmonious association. This harmony at the level of inner truth means sharing the understanding of the truth of transcendental liberation. At the phenomenal level, harmony means dwelling together in harmony. Harmony in speech means no arguments, harmony in perceptions, harmony in wealth or sharing material goods equally, and harmony in precepts or sharing the same precepts. Buddhist monks and nuns have left the family life to practice the Buddha's teachings. They usually own only a few things, such as robes, an alms bowl and a razor to shave their heads. They aim to give up the need for material possessions. They concentrate on their inner development and gain much understanding into the nature of things by leading a pure and simple life. Community, congregation, of monks, nuns, and lay Buddhists who cultivate the way. The Buddhist Brotherhood or an assembly of brotherhood of monks. Sangha also means an assembly, collection, company, or society. The corporate assembly of at least three or four monks under a chairperson. Sangha is an assembly of Buddhists. However, in a narrow sense, Sangha means the members of which are called bhikkhus or bhikkhunis, however, in a wider sense, Sangha means four classes of disciples, monks, nuns, upasaka and upasaka. Usually, an assembly of monks. The corporate assembly of at least three or four monks under a chairman, empowered to hear a confession, grant absolution, and ordain. The church or monastic order, the third member of the Taratna. 342. Taking refuge on the three gems. The three refuges are three of the most important entrances to the great enlightenment. There are several problems for a Buddhist who does not take refuge in the three gems. There is no chance to meet the Sangha for guidance. Buddhist sutras always say, if one does not take refuge in the Sangha, it's easier to be reborn into the animal kingdom. Not taking refuge in the Sangha means that there is no good example for one to follow. If there is no one who can show us the right path to cultivate all good and eliminate all evil, then ignorance arises, and ignorance is one of the main causes of rebirth in the animal realms. There is no chance to study Dharma in order to distinguish right from wrong, good from bad. Thus desire appears, and desire is one of the main causes of rebirth in the hungry ghost. Therefore, Buddhist sutras always say, if one does not take refuge in the Dharma, it's easier to be reborn in the hungry ghost realms. There is not any chance to get blessings from Buddhas, nor chance to imitate the compassion of the Buddhas. Thus, anger increased, and anger is one of the main causes of the rebirth in hell. Therefore, Buddhist sutras always say, if one does not take refuge in Buddha, it's easier to be reborn in hell. In the Dharmapada Sutra, the Buddha taught. 
men were driven by fear to go to take refuge in the mountains, in the forests, and in sacred trees, Dharmapada 188. But that is not a safe refuge, or no such refuge is supreme. A man who has gone to such refuge is not delivered from all pain and afflictions. Dharmapada 189. On the contrary, he who take refuge in the Buddhas, the Dharma and the Anga, sees with right knowledge, Dharmapada 190. With clear understanding of the Four Noble Truths. Suffering, the cause of suffering, the destruction of suffering, and the Eightfold Noble Path which leads to the cessation of suffering, Dharmapada 191. That is the secure refuge, the supreme refuge. He who has gone to that refuge is released from all suffering, Dharmapada 192. To take refuge in the Charatna, a Buddhist must first find a virtuous monk who has seriously observed precepts and has profound knowledge to represent the Sangha in performing an ordination ceremony. An admission of a lay disciple, after recantation of his previous wrong belief and sincere repetition to the abbot or monk of the three refuges. Take refuge in the Buddha as a supreme teacher. To the Buddha, I return to rely, vowing that all living beings understand the great way profoundly and bring forth the body mind, one bow. Take refuge in the Dharma as the best medicine in life. To the Dharma, I return and rely, vowing that all living beings deeply enter the Sutra treasury and have wisdom like the sea, one bow. Take refuge in the Sangha, wonderful Buddha's disciples. To the Sangha, I return and rely, vowing that all living beings form together a great assembly, one and all in harmony without obstructions one bow. When listening to the three refuges, Buddhists should have the full intention of keeping them for life, even when life is hardship, never change the mind. To take refuge in the Triratna, or to commit oneself to the Triratna, i.e. Buddha, Dharma, Sangha, Buddha, His Truth, and His Order. Those who sincerely take refuge in Buddha, Dharma and Sangha, shall not go to the woeful realm. After casting human life away, they will fill the world of heaven. Any Buddhist follower must attend an initiation ceremony with the three gems, Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, i.e., he or she must venerate the Buddha, follow his teachings, and respect all his ordained disciples. Buddhists swear to avoid deities and demons, pagans, and evil religious groups. A refuge is a place where people go when they are distressed or when they need safety and security. There are many types of refuge. When people are unhappy, they take refuge with their friends, when they are worried and frightened, they might take refuge in false hope and beliefs. As they approach death, they might take refuge in the belief of an eternal heaven. But, as the Buddha says, none of these are true refuges because they do not give comfort and security based on reality. Taking refuge in the three gems is necessary for any Buddhists. It should be noted that the initiation ceremony, though simple, is the most important event for any Buddhist disciple, since it is his first step on the way toward liberation and illumination. This is also the first opportunity for a disciple to vow to diligently observe the five precepts, to become a vegetarian, to recite Buddhist sutras, to cultivate his own mind, to nurture himself with good deeds, and to follow the Buddha's footsteps toward his own enlightenment. To take refuge means to vow to take refuge in the Buddha Dharma Sangha. The root senior in Sanskrit or Sara in Pali means to move, to go, so that Saranam would denote a moving, or he that which goes before or with another. Thus, the sentence Gachayomi Bhadam Saranam means I go to Buddha as my guide. Take refuge in the three precious ones, or the three refuges. In Buddhism, a refuge is something on which one can rely for support and guidance, not in a sense of fleeing back or a place of shelter. In most Buddhist traditions, going for refuge in the three refuges or three jewels, Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha is considered to be the central act that establishes a person as a Buddhist. Going for refuge is an acknowledgement that one requires aid and instruction, and that one has decided that one is committed to following the Buddhist path. The Buddha is one who has successfully found the path to liberation, and he teaches it to others through his instructions on Dharma. The Sangha, or monastic community, consists of people who have dedicated their lives to this practice and teaching, 
and so are a source of instruction and role models for laypeople. The standard refuge prayer is. I go for refuge in the Buddha. I go for refuge in the Dharma. I go for refuge in the Sangha. These three phrases mean. I go to Buddha, the law, and the order, as the destroyers of my fears, the first by the Buddha's teachings, the second by the truth of his teachings, and the third by good examples and virtues of the Sangha. There are five stages of taking refuge. Take refuge in the Buddha, take refuge in the Dharma, take refuge in the Sangha, take refuge in the Eight Commandments, take refuge in the Ten Commandments. These are five modes of Trisarana, or formulas of trust in the Triratna, taken by those who First, those who turn from heresy. Second, those who take the Five Commandments. Third, those who take the Eight Commandments. Fourth, those who take the Ten Commandments. Fifth, those who take the Complete Commandments. The ceremony of taking refuge in the Triratna and observing precepts should be celebrated solemnly in front of the Buddha's shrine with the represent of the Sangha in performing an ordination ceremony. The initiation ceremony must be simple, depend on the situation of each place. However, it must be solemn. It is led by Buddhist master who would grace it by standing before the altar decorated with the Buddha's portrait, with the assistance of other monks and nuns, relatives, and friends. As for the initiated, he must be clean and correctly dressed. Under the guidance of the master, he must recite three times the penance verses in order to cleanse his karmas. As a Buddhist disciple, I swear to follow in Buddha's footsteps during my lifetime, not in any god, deity or demon. As a Buddhist disciple, I swear to perform Buddhist dharma during my lifetime, not pagan, heretic beliefs or practices. As a Buddhist disciple, I swear to listen to the Sangha during my lifetime, not evil religious groups. The Buddha had said. I am a realized Buddha, you will be the Buddha to be realized, meaning that we all have a Buddha nature from within. Therefore, after having taken the initiation with the three gems, we must repeat the above vows, addressing this time the inner Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. As a Buddhist disciple, I vow to take refuge in the inner Buddha. To the Buddha, I return to rely, vowing that all living beings understand the great way profoundly and bring forth the body mind, one bow. As a Buddhist disciple, I vow to take refuge in the inner Dharma. To the Dharma, I return and rely, vowing that all living beings deeply enter the Sutra treasury, and have wisdom like the sea, one bow. As a Buddhist disciple, I vow to take refuge in the inner Sangha. To the Sangha, I return and rely, vowing that all living beings form together a great assembly one and all in harmony without obstructions one bow. When listening to the three refuges, Buddhists should have the full intention of keeping them for life, even when life is hardship, never change the mind. Buddhism has indeed proved to be the genuine article and has given those people where it has come the highest right conduct for a human being. The gentle, courtesy and upright lives of the Buddhists from all over the world show that Buddhism has indeed proved to be the genuine article and has given those people where it has come the highest right conduct for a human being. If happiness is the result of good thoughts, words and actions, then indeed devout Buddhists have found the secret of right living. In fact, have we ever found true happiness resulting from wrong thinking and wrongdoing, or can we ever sow evil cause and reap sweet fruits? Furthermore, can any of us escape from the law of change or run away from the sufferings and afflictions? According to Buddhism, false refuge means not to take refuge in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. From the beginningless time, we had taken refuge in momentary and transitory pleasures, with the hope to find some satisfaction in these pleasures. We consider them as a way out of our depression and boredom, only end up with other sufferings and afflictions. When the Buddha talked about taking refuge, he wanted to advise us to break out of such desperate search for satisfaction. Taking true refuge involves a changing of our attitude, it comes from seeing the ultimate worthlessness of the transitory phenomena we are ordinarily attached to. When we see clearly the unsatisfactory nature of the things we have been chasing after, we should determine to take refuge in the triple gem. The benefits of a true refuge. 
Devout Buddhists, especially lay people, should try to understand the Four Noble Truths, because the more we have the understanding of the Four Noble Truths, the more we respect the Buddha, the Dharma, and the sacred disciples of the Buddha. Of course we all respect the Buddha, but all of us should gain a profound admiration for the Dharma too for at the time we do not have the Buddha, the Dharma is the true refuge for us, the lighthouse that guide us in our path of cultivation towards liberation. The process of taking refuge is not a process that happens on the day of the ceremony of taking refuge or take place within just a few days or a few years. It takes place not only in this very life but also for many many eons in the future. Besides, there are still other benefits of taking refuge include the followings. First, we become a Buddhist, second, we can destroy all previously accumulated karma, third, we will easily accumulate a huge amount of merit, fourth, we will seldom be bothered by the harmful actions of others, fifth, we will not fall to the lower realms, sixth, we will effortlessly achieve our goal in the path of cultivation, and lastly, it is a matter of time, we will soon be enlightened. Take refuge in the triple gem for secret sects, according to the first Tibetan Panchen Lama. With great bless, I arise as my Guru Yidam. From my clear body masses of light rays diffuse into the ten directions. Blessing the world and all sentient beings. All becomes perfectly arrayed with only extremely pure qualities. From the state of an exalted and virtuous mind. I and all infinite, old mother sentient beings. From this moment until our supreme enlightenment. We vow to go for refuge to the gurus and the three precious gems. Homage to the guru, Namo Gurabhya. Homage to the Buddha, Namo Bidaya. Homage to the Dharma, Namo Dharmaya. Homage to the Sangha, Namo Singhayu three times. For the sake of all mother sentient beings. I shall become my guru deity. And place all sentient beings in the supreme state of a guru deity three times. For the sake of all mother sentient beings, I shall quickly attain supreme state of a guru deity in this very life three times. I shall free all mother sentient beings from suffering and place them in the great bliss of Buddhahood three times. Therefore, I shall now practice the profound path of Guru Yidam Yoga three times. Amaham three times. Pure clouds of outer, inner and secret offerings. Fearsome items and objects to bond us closely and fields of vision pervade the reaches of space, earth and sky spreading out inconceivably. In essence wisdom knowledge. In aspect inner offerings and various offerings objects as enjoyments of the six senses they function to generate the special wisdom knowledge of bliss and voidness. Take refuge in the triple gem and hundred thousand Buddhas in the pure land for secret sects according to La Zang Dragpa. I take safe direction from the three precious gems, I shall liberate every limited being. I reaffirm and correct my bodhisattva aim, three times. May the surface of the land in every direction be pure, without even a pebble. As smooth as the palm of a child's hand, naturally polished, as is a barrel gem. May divine and human objects of offering actually arrayed and those envisioned as peerless clouds of Samantabhadra offerings. From the heart of the guardian of the hundreds of deities of Tusita, the land of joy, on the tip of a rain-bearing cloud resembling a mound of fresh white curd. We request you light and grace this sight, King of the Dharma, Lazang Dragpa, the omniscient, with the pair of your spiritual sons. Seated on lion thrones, lotus, and moon in the sky before us, ennobling, impeccable gurus, we request you remain, with white smile of delight. For hundreds of eons to further the teachings as the foremost fields for growing a positive force for us with minds of belief in the facts. Your minds have the intellect that comprehends the full extent of what can be known. Your speech, with its elegant explanations, becomes an adornment for the ears of those of good fortune. Your bodies are radiantly handsome with glorious renown. We prostrate to you whom to behold, hear, or recall is worthwhile. Refreshing offerings of water, assorted flowers, fragrant incense, lights, scented water, and more. This ocean of clouds of offerings, actually arranged and imagined here. We present to you foremost fields for growing a positive force. 
whatever destructive actions of body, speech and mind that we have committed since beginningless time, and especially the breaches of our three sets of vows, we openly admit, one by one, with fervent regret from our heart. In this degenerate age, you persevered with a phenomenal amount of study and practice, and, by riding yourselves of the eight childish feelings, you made the respites and enrichments of your lives worthwhile, and from the depth of our hearts, we rejoice, O oh guardians, in the towering waves of your enlightening deeds. In the towering waves of your enlightening deeds that billow in the skies of your dharmakayas, we request you to release a rain of profound and vast dharma to rain upon the absorbent earth of us, eager to be tamed in fitting ways. May whatever constructive forces built up by this benefit the teachings and those who wander, and may they especially enable the heart of the teachings of the ennobling, impeccable Lazang Dragpa to beat ever on. By directing and offering to the Buddha fields this base, anointed with fragrant waters, strewn with flowers, and decked with Mount Meru, four islands, the sun, and the mon. May all those who wander be led to pure land. I send forth this mandala to you precious gurus by the force of having made fervent requests in this way. From the hearts of the ennobling, impeccable father and the pairs of his spiritual sons, hollow beams of white light radiate forth. Their tips combine into one and penetrate us through the crowns of our heads. Through the conduit of these white tubes of light, white nectars flow freely the color of milk, purging us of diseases, demons, negative forces, obstacles, and constant habits, bearing none. Our bodies become as pure and as clear as a crystal. You are a Valakitasvara, a great treasury of compassion. Manjushri, a commander of flawless wisdom. Vajrapani, a destroyer of all hordes of demonic forces. Tsinkapa, the crown jewel of the erudite masters of the land of snow. At your feet, Lazang Dragpa, we make your requests three times. Glorious, precious root guru, come. Grace the lotus and moon seats at the crowns of our heads. Taking care of us through your great kindness. Direct us to the actual attainments of your body, speech and mind. Glorious, precious guru, come grace the lotus eats at our hearts. Taking care of us through your great kindness. Remain steadfast to the core of our enlightenment. By this constructive act, may we quickly actualize ourselves as Guru Buddhas, and thereafter lead to that state, all wandering beings, not neglecting even one. 343. Own mind takes refuge with own self-nature. Own mind takes refuge with own self-nature, also means markless triple refuge. According to the Platform Sutra of the Sixth Patriarch's Dharma Treasure, the Sixth Patriarch, Wi Neng, taught. Good knowing advisors, I will transmit the precepts of the triple refuge that has no mark. Good knowing advisors, take refuge with the enlightened, the honored, the doubly complete. Take refuge with the right, the honored, that is apart from desire. Take refuge with the pure, the honored among the multitudes. From this day forward, we call enlightenment our master, and will never again take refuge with deviant demons or outside religions. We constantly enlighten ourselves by means of the triple jewel of our own self-nature. Good knowing advisors, I exhort you all to take refuge with the triple jewel of your own nature. The Buddha, which is enlightenment, the Dharma, which is right, and the Sangha, which is pure. When your mind takes refuge with enlightenment, deviant confusion does not arise. Desire decreases, so that you know contentment, and are able to keep away from wealth and from the opposite sex. That is called the honored, the doubly complete. When your mind takes refuge with what is right, there are no deviant views in any of your thoughts, because there are no deviant views, there is no self, other, arrogance, greed, love or attachment. That is called the honored that is apart from desire. When your own mind takes refuge with the pure, your self-nature is not stained by attachment to any state of defilement, desire or love that is called the honored among the multitudes. If you cultivate this practice, you take refuge with yourself. Common people do not understand that, and so, from morning to night, they take the triple refuge precepts. They say they take refuge with the Buddha, but where is the Buddha? If they can't see the Buddha, how can they return to him? Their talk is absurd. Good knowing advisors, each of you examine yourselves. 
do not make wrong use of the mind. The Abhadamsaka Sutra clearly states that you should take refuge with your own Buddha, not with some other Buddha. If you do not take refuge with the Buddha in yourself, there is no one you can rely on. Now that you are self-awakened, you should each take refuge with the triple jewel of your own mind. Within yourself, regulate your mind and nature, outside yourself, respect others. That is to take refuge with yourself. In the Dharma Jewel Platform Sutra, Chapter 6, the Sixth Patriarch taught. Good knowing advisors, now that you have taken refuge with the Triple Jewel, you should listen carefully while I explain to you the three bodies of the single substance, the self-nature of the Buddha, so that you may see the three bodies and become completely enlightened to your own self-nature. Repeat after me. One I take refuge with the clear pure Dharma body of the Buddha within my own body. Two, I take refuge with the hundred thousand myriad transformation bodies of the Buddha within my own body. Three, I take refuge with the complete and full reward body of the Buddha within my own body. Good knowing advisors, the form body is an in, it cannot be returned to. The three bodies of the Buddha exist within the self-nature of worldly people, but, because they are confused, they do not see the nature within them and so, seek the three bodies of the Tathagata outside themselves. They do not see that the three bodies of the Buddha are within their own bodies. Listen to what I say, for it can cause you to see the three bodies of your own self-nature within your own body. The three bodies of the Buddha arise from your own self-nature and are not obtained from outside. What is the clear pure Dharma body Buddha? The worldly person's nature is basically clear and pure, and the ten thousand dharmas are produced from it. The thought of evil produces evil actions, and the thought of good produces good actions. Thus, all dharmas exist within self-nature. This is like the sky which is always clear, and the sun and moon which are always bright, so that if they are obscured by floating clouds, it is bright above the clouds and dark below them. But if the wind suddenly blows and scatters the clouds, there is brightness above and below, and the myriad forms appear. The worldly peasant's nature constantly drifts like those clouds in the sky. Good knowing advisors, intelligence is like the sun, and wisdom is like the moon. Intelligence and wisdom are constantly bright, but, if you are attached to external states, the floating clouds of false thought cover the self-nature, so that it cannot shine. If you meet a good knowing advisor, if you listen to the true and right dharma and cast out your own confusion and falseness, then inside and out there will be penetrating brightness, and within the self-nature all the ten thousand dharmas will appear. That is how it is with those who see their own nature. It is called the clear pure dharma body of the Buddha. Good knowing advisors. When your own mind takes refuge with your self-nature, it takes refuge with the true Buddha. To take refuge is to rid your self-nature of ego-centered and unwholesome thoughts as well as jealousy, obsequiousness, deceitfulness, contempt, pride, conceit, and deviant views, and all other unwholesome tendencies whenever they arise. To take refuge is to be always aware of your own transgressions and never to speak of other people's good or bad traits. Always to be humble and polite is to have penetrated to the self-nature without any obstacle that is taking refuge. 344. Bodhisattva Bhumis. Bhumi is a Sanskrit term referring to stages of development of a bodhisattva. Each succeeding level represents a further stage of spiritual accomplishment and is accompanied by progressively greater power and wisdom. In Mahayana, there are ten levels through which bodhisattvas progress on their way to the attainment of Buddhahood. 1. Very joyous, Pramudita, or land of joy which is attained when a bodhisattva first directly perceives emptiness, sunyata, and which is simultaneous with the path of seeing, darsanamarga, bodhisattvas on this level develop the perfection, paramita, of generosity, dana. 2. The stainless, vimala, or land of purity, during which bodhisattvas ripen the perfection of ethics, sila, and overcome all tendencies to engage in negative actions, 3. The luminous, Prabhakari, or land of radiance, when bodhisattvas cultivate the perfection of patience, Santi. 4. The radiant, Arsismati, or Beltsing land, when they work at the perfection of effort, Virya. 
5. The difficult to cultivate, Sudarjaya, or land of extreme difficult to conquer, during which they ripen the perfection of concentration, Dhyana. 6. The manifest, Abhimuki, or land in view of wisdom, on which they develop the perfection of wisdom, Prajna. 7. The Ganafar, Durangama, or far reaching land, the stage of perfecting skill and mean, Abhayukasalya. The ability skillfully to adapt their teachings to any audience. 8. The immovable, Akala, or immovable land, during which they work at the perfection of aspiration, Pranidhana. From this point onward, they are incapable of backsliding and will inevitably progress steadily toward Buddhahood. 9. The good intelligence Samdhamati, or land of good thoughts. The level on which they advance the perfection of power, Bala, and fully comprehend all doctrines. 10. The cloud of doctrine, Dharma Megha, or land of Dharma clouds, during which they eliminate the subtlest traces of remaining afflictions and cultivate the perfection of knowledge, Jnana, and finally attain Buddhahood. Probably in the 4th century AD, Asanga, one of the leading figures of the Indian Buddhist Yogacara tradition, wrote a Sanskrit treatise named Yogacara Bhumi Sastra. It outlines the path to Buddhahood followed by the Bodhisattva and describes the practices pertaining to the path. It is the 15th section of his voluminous levels of yogic practice, Yogacara Bhumi. A Sangha describes 10 Bodhisattva Bhumi, grading the upward course of the Bodhisattva's spiritual development, which culminates in the realization of Buddhahood. The work is said to have been dictated to him in or from the Tusita heaven by Maitreya, about the doctrine of the Yogacara or Vijnanavada. The Sastra was translated into Chinese by Xuan Tsang, is the foundation text of this school. Treatise on the Stages of the Yogacara. This is the fundamental work of the Yogacara school, which the author might have been either a Sangha or Matrayanatha. Later in the 5th century AD Dharmatrata and Badasana based on the Bodhisattva Bhumi Sastra to compose the Yogacara Bhumi Sutra on the methods of meditation for the Hinayana. The sutra was translated into Chinese by Buddhabhadra. The sutra was divided into five parts. First, the 17 stages presenting the progression on the path to enlightenment with the help of the Yogacara teaching, this is the most important part. Second, interpretations of these stages. Third, explanation of these sutras from which the Yogacara doctrine of the stages draws support. Fourth, classifications contained in these sutras. Fifth, Topics from the Buddhist Canon, Sutra, Vinaya Pitaka, Abhidharma. The Yogacara Bhumi Sastra itself outlines the path to Buddhahood followed by the Bodhisattva and describes the practices pertaining to the path. It is the 15th section of his voluminous levels of yogic practice. There are 10 Bodhisattva Bhumi, grading the upward course of the Bodhisattva's spiritual development, which culminates in the realization of Buddhahood. The first stage is the stage of joy in which one rejoices at realizing a partial aspect of the truth and having overcome the former difficulties and now entering on the path to Buddhahood. The second stage is the stage of purity in which one is free from all defilements or freedom from all possible defilements and afflictions. The third is the stage of further enlightenment. In the stage of the emission of light, one radiates the light of wisdom. The fourth is the stage of glowing wisdom in which the flame of wisdom burns away earthly desires. The fifth is the stage of mastery of utmost or final difficulties, or the stage of overcoming final illusions of darkness. The sixth is the stage of the open way of wisdom above definitions of impurity and purity, or the stage of the sign of supreme wisdom in which supreme wisdom appears. The seventh is the stage of proceeding afar getting above ideas of self in order to help others. In the stage of progression, one rises above the state of two vehicles. The eighth is the stage of attainment of calm unperturbedness. In this stage of immobility, one dwells firmly in the truth of the middle way. The ninth is the stage of the finest discriminatory wisdom, knowing where and how to save. In the stage of all penetrating wisdom, one preaches the law freely and without restriction. The tenth is the stage of attaining to the fertilizing powers of the law cloud. In the stage of the cloud of teaching, one benefits all sentient beings with the law, Dharma. According to the Flower Adornment Sutra, Avadamsaka Sutra, and the Surangama Sutra, 
There are ten stages or characteristics of a Buddha. The ten stages of a Mahayana Bodhisattva development. The ten stages of the Bodhisattva, originally found in the Dasa Bhumi Sutra of the Avadamsaka school, are simply namesakes for ordinary people who have no experience in the path of no learning, a Saksa Marga. These Mahayanistic stages are said to have been profounded in order to distinguish the position of the Bodhisattva from those of the Hinayanistic Sravaka and Pratika Buddha. The first stage of joy, or utmost joy, at having overcome the former difficulties, realizing a partial aspect of the truth, and now entering on the path to Buddhahood and enlightenment. In this stage, the Bodhisattva attains the holy nature for the first time and reaches the highest pleasure, having been removed from all errors of life view, darsana marga, and having fully realized the twofold sunyata, pajala and dharma. In this stage, a bodhisattva feels delight because he is able to pass from the narrow ideal of personal nirvana to the higher ideal of emancipation, all sentient beings from the suffering of ignorance. In the Surangama Sutra, Book 8, the Buddha told Ananda, Ananda, these good men have successfully penetrated through the great body. Their enlightenment is entirely like the thus come ones. They have fathomed the state of Buddhahood. This is called the ground of happiness. The second Bhumi is the land of freedom from defilement, or the land of purity, or ground of leaving filth. Negatively speaking, Vimala means freedom from defilement. Positively speaking, Vimala means purity of heart. This is the stage of purity, perfect of discipline, and freedom from all possible defilement through practices of dhyana and samadhi. The stage of purity in which a bodhisattva overcomes all passions and impurity. In this stage, the bodhisattva reaches the perfection of discipline, sila, and becomes utterly taintless with regard to morality. In the Surangama Sutra, Book 8, the Buddha told Anana, The differences enter into identity, the identity is destroyed. This is called the ground of leaving filth. The third stage is the land of radiance, or the ground of emitting light. The stage of further enlightenment where Bodhisattva's insight penetrates into the impermanence of all things, or where he gains insight into impermanence, anitya, of existence, and develops the virtue of patience, kshanti, in bearing difficulties, and in actively helping all sentient beings. In this stage of the emission of light, after having attained the deepest introspective insight, the Bodhisattva radiates the light of wisdom, gets the perfection of forbearance, kshanti, and becomes free from the errors of life culture, Bhavana Marga. According to the Surangama Sutra, Book 8, the Buddha told Ananda, At the point of ultimate purity, brightness comes forth. This is called the ground of emitting light. The fourth stage is the blazing land, or the ground of blazing wisdom. Archismati is the stage in which the Bodhisattva practices passionlessness and detachment, and burns the twin coverings of defilement and ignorance. This is the stage of glowing or flaming wisdom where Bodhisattva attains the perfection of bravery or effort, virya, thereby increasing the power of insight more and more. He is able to burn away earthly desires as well as remaining false conceptions, develops wisdom and perfects the 37 requisites of enlightenment. In the Surangama Sutra, Book 8, the Buddha told Ananda, When the brightness becomes ultimate, enlightenment is full. This is called the ground of blazing wisdom. The fifth stage is the land extremely difficult to conquer, or the ground of invincibility. The stage of mastery of utmost or final difficulties, or illusions of darkness, or ignorance. In this stage, the Bodhisattva develops the spirit of saneness and absorbs himself in meditation, gets the perfection of meditative concentration, in order to achieve an intuitive grasp of the truth to understand the Four Noble Truths, to clear away doubt and uncertainty, to know what is proper and what is not. During this stage Bodhisattva continues to work on the perfection of the 37 requisites of enlightenment. In the Surangama Sutra, Book 8, the Buddha told Ananda, No identity or difference can be attained. This is called the ground of invincibility. The sixth stage is the land in view of wisdom, or the ground of manifestation. In this stage, the bodhisattva attains the perfection of wisdom or insight, prajna, 
recognizes that all dharmas are free from characteristics origins and without distinction between existence and non-existence. In this stage, the bodhisattva stands face to face with reality. He realizes the sameness of all phenomena. Thus, the sign of supreme wisdom begins to appear, owing to the perfection of the virtue of wisdom and comprehension of nothingness, bodhisattva can enter nirvana, however, also retains equanimity as to purity and impurity, so he still vow to come back to the world to save beings. This is the stage of the open way of wisdom above definitions of impurity and purity. According to the Surangama Sutra, Book 8, the Buddha told Ananda, With unconditioned true suchness, the nature is spotless, and brightness is revealed. This is called the ground of manifestation. The seventh stage is the stage of far-reaching land, or the ground of traveling far. The stage of proceeding. Afar, or far-going, which is the position farthest removed the selfish state of the two vehicles. He is getting above ideas of self, gaining knowledge and skillful means which enable him to exercise great mercy to all beings by helping them proceed the way to enlightenment. After passing through this stage, the bodhisattva rises above the states of the two vehicles, and it's impossible to fall back to lower levels. In this stage, the bodhisattva acquires the knowledge that enable him to adopt skillful means for his work of salvation. He has won nirvana, but without entering it, for he is busily engaged for the emancipation of other sentient beings. In the Surangama Sutra, Book 8, the Buddha told Ananda, Coming to the farthest limits of true suchness is called the ground of traveling far. The eighth stage is the immovable land, or the stage of immovability or the ground of immovability. When the bodhisattva reaches here, he experiences the anatpataka dharmak santi or the acquiescence in the unoriginatedness of all phenomena. He knows in detail the evolution and involution of the universe. In this stage, he gets rid of discrimination and has a thorough understanding of the nature of existence, realizing why it is like maya, etc. How discrimination starts from our innate longing to see existence divided into subject and object, and how the mind and what belongs to it are stirred up, he would then practice all that pertains to the life of a good Buddhist, leading to the path of truth all those who have not yet come to it. This is the bodhisattva's nirvana which is not extinction. In this stage, the bodhisattva completes the perfection of vow, pranidhana, and abiding in the view of no characteristic, alexana wanders freely according to any opportunity. In this stage, the bodhisattva dwells firmly in the truth of the middle way, he reaches the stage of attainment of calm unperturbedness, where he no longer be disturbed by anything. He gains the ability to transfer his merit to other beings and renowns the accumulation of further karmic treasures. In the Surangama Sutra, Book 8, the Buddha told Ananda, the single mind of true suchness is called the ground of immovability. The ninth stage is the land of good thoughts, or the ground of good wisdom. In this stage, the bodhisattva acquires comprehensive knowledge, unfathomable by ordinary human intelligence. He knows the desires and thoughts of men, and is able to teach them according to their capacities. This is the stage of wisdom of the bodhisattva is complete, all-penetrating wisdom. In this stage he possesses the finest discriminatory wisdom, six supernatural powers, four certainties, eight liberations, all dharanas. He knows the nature of all dharmas and expound them without problems, without restriction. He also knows when, where and how to save other sentient beings. In this stage, the bodhisattva preaches everywhere discriminating between those who are to be saved and those who are not. According to the Surangama Sutra, Book 8, the Buddha told Ananda, bringing forth the function of true suchness is called the ground of good wisdom. Ananda. All bodhisattvas at this point and beyond have reached the effortless way in their cultivation. Their merit and virtue are perfected, and so all the previous positions are also called the level of cultivation. The tenth stage is the land of Dharma clouds, or the ground of the Dharma cloud, the stage of attaining to the fertilizing powers of the law cloud, the cloud of teaching. Bodhisattva has realized all understanding and immeasurable virtue. The dharmakaya of the bodhisattva is fully developed. 
In this stage, the Bodhisattva benefits all sentient beings with the law, just as a cloud sends down rain impartially on all things. His Buddhahood is confirmed by all Buddhas. In this he acquires perfection of contemplation, knows the mystery of existence, and is consecrated as perfect. In fact, this is the stage of the Buddha who is represented by such a Bodhisattva, he attains Buddhahood. In this stage, the Bodhisattva is able to preach the Dharma to all the world equally, just as the rain clouds pour down heavy rains during drought. The with a wonderful cloud of compassionate protection, one covers the sea of Nirvana. This is called the ground of the Dharma cloud. 345. A Brief History of Buddhist Sects According to Edward Kahn's, a famous Buddhist scholar, in a short history of Buddhism, Buddhism has so far persisted for about 2,500 years, and during that period, it has undergone profound and radical changes. Its history can conveniently be divided into four periods. The first period is that of the old Buddhism, which largely coincided with what later came to be known as the Hinayana, the second is marked by the rise of the Mahayana, the third by that of the Tantra and Zen. This bring us to about 1000 AD. After that Buddhism no longer renewed itself, but just persisted, and the last 1000 years can be taken together as the fourth period. Geographically, first period Buddhism remained almost purely Indian, during the second period it started on its conquest of Eastern Asia, and was in its turn considerably influenced by non-Indian thought, during the third, creative centers of Buddhist thought were established outside India, particularly in China. On the field of emancipation, these periods differ in the conception of the type of cultivation. In the first period the ideal saint is an arat, or a person who has non-attachment, in whom all craving is extinct, and who will no more be reborn in this world. In the second period, the ideal is the bodhisattva, a person who wishes to save all sentient beings, and who hopes ultimately to become an omniscient Buddha. In the third period, the ideal is a siddha, or a person who is so much in harmony with the cosmos that he is under no constraint whatsoever, and is a free agent, who is able to manipulate the cosmic forces both inside and outside himself. A special characteristic of Buddhism throughout these periods is that the innovations of each new phase were backed up by the production of a fresh canonical literature, which, although clearly compassed many centuries after the Buddha's nirvana, claims to be the word of the Buddha himself. The scriptures of the first period were supplemented in the second by a large number of Mahayana sutras, and in the third by a truly enormous number of tantras. Buddhism has been persisting for more than 2,500 years. During the period of almost 26 centuries Buddhism has undergone a lot of ups and downs. Before developing abroad, at first, Buddhism developed solely inside Indian continent. The Buddha had never written any of his teachings for his disciples. All Buddhist scriptures were recited and accumulated by his followers hundreds of years after the Buddha's nirvana. During the first 500 years after the Buddha's nirvana, several big meetings called Buddhist councils, in which matters of greater importance were discussed and clarified. Thus, at the start, after each Buddhist council, Buddhist scriptures had undergone considerable changes. As a result, in each new phase, his followers produced fresh canonical literature which, although clearly compassed many centuries after the Buddha's nirvana, claims to be the word of the Buddha himself. In the first council, the Sangha only tried to consolidate their communities with the clarification of the Buddha's teachings and rules. In the second Buddhist council, Buddha's traditions were confusing and ambiguous, and the overall result was the first schism in the Sangha. During the first 500 years of Buddhism the scriptures were transmitted orally, and they were written down only towards the end of the first period. Of course, we are not so sure if the Buddha's actual words were transmitted into what we now call scriptures. During his lifetime, the Buddha may have taught in Ardhamagadhi, but none of his sayings is preserved in its original form. As for the earliest canon, even its language is still a matter of dispute. All we have are translations of what may have been the early canon into other Indian languages, such as Pale and Sanskrit. Thus, not long after the Buddha's nirvana, 
a lot of differences in the interpretation of the Buddha's teachings ignited. And thus not long after the Buddha's nirvana, Buddhism had divided itself at some unspecified time into a number of sects, of which usually 18 are counted, however, in fact more than 30 sects are known to us, at least by name. Most of these sects had their own canon. Nearly all of these canons are lost either because they were never written down, or because the written records were destroyed by humans or the depredations of time. As different communities fixed themselves in different parts of India, local traditions developed. Even though these sects had differences in geography and interpretations in the Buddha's teachings, there remained the original core Buddha's teachings. From the difference in the Buddha's teachings, about 140 years after the Buddha's nirvana, the Staviras separated from the Mahasangikas, who in their turn provided about the beginning of the Christian era, the starting point for the Mahayana. About 400 years after the Buddha's nirvana, a number of Buddhists felt that the existing doctrines had become stale and somewhat useless. They believed that the doctrines required reformation, so as to meet the needs of new ages, new populations and new social circumstances, so they set out to produce a new literature. They also believed that old literature could not sustain a living religion as Buddhism. Unless counterbalanced by constant innovation, it would become fossilized and lost its living qualities. Philosophically speaking, we must sincerely say that philosophy is one of the main causes of sectarian divisions, for philosophy differs from all other branches of knowledge in that it allows of more than one solution to each problem. And Buddhism is not only known as a religion, but it is also known as a profound living philosophy. In the course of carrying out cultivation, Buddhist monks and nuns came up against problems in the field of philosophy, such as the nature and classification of knowledge, criteria of reality, cause and effect, time and space, the existence or non-existence of a self, and so on. The first period concentrated on psychological questions, the second on ontological, the third on cosmic. The first is concerned with individuals gaining control over their own minds, and psychological analysis is the method by which self-control is sought, the second turns to the nature of true reality, and the realization in oneself of that true nature of things is held to be decisive for salvation. The third sees adjustment and harmony with the cosmos as the clue to enlightenment and uses age-old magical and occult methods to achieve it. Historically speaking, the first division of opinion was between those who thought that only the present exists and those who maintained that the past and future are as real as present. Furthermore, two dharmas were often counted as unconditioned, space and nirvana. Some schools, however, doubted whether space is either real or unconditioned, while others seemed to have disputed the unconditioned nature of nirvana, there was no agreement on what kind of reality should be assigned to it. Some believed that it had none at all, while others asserted that it alone should be regarded as truly real. The Mahasangikas are those who represented the viewpoint of the laypeople against the monkish party. They minimized the importance of the historical Buddha, Sakyamuni, whom they replaced by the Buddha who is the embodiment of Dharma, Dharmakaya. In the Lotus Sutra, the Buddha abides for eons and eons, from eternity, and that he preaches the law at all times in countless places and innumerable disguises. The Mahasangikas maintain that everything, the contingent as well as the absolute, is fictitious, a mere concept, mere verbal chatter, without any substance of its own. The totality of these fictitious dharmas was contrasted with a dharma element or dharmahood, which was further identified with one vast emptiness, into which all dharmas are absorbed. The Pujalavadins caused a great stir with their view that in addition to the impersonal dharmas, there is still a person to be reckoned with. They deliberately challenged the fundamental dogma of all contemporary Buddhist scholars. The schism between Staviras and Mahasangikas was occasioned by the question of the status of the Arat. The Mahasangikas took the line that in several ways the Arats fell short of the godlike stature which the Staviras attributed to them. Arats were not yet entirely free because, among other things, they could still be troubled by demons, had their doubts, and were ignorant of many things. With the Mahayana the Arats have become worthy, but they are selfish people. 
their philosophical statements are no longer based on Arat's experiences, but on those of the bodhisattvas who unselfishly prepare themselves for Buddhahood during eons of self-sacrificing struggle. The Mahasangikas identified emptiness with the nature of the Buddha. For them, all beings, both worldly and supramundane, have the void for their basis. The void is the Buddha nature and the great final nirvana. The Buddha nature must therefore necessarily exist in all beings. The Mahasangikas regarded the historical Buddha as alien to the real Buddha, who was transcendental altogether supramundane, had no imperfections or impurities whatsoever, was omniscient, all-powerful, infinite, and eternal, forever withdrawn into trance, never distracted or asleep. The historical Buddha was only a magical creation of the transcendental Buddha, a fictitious creature sent by him to appear in the world to conform himself to its ways and teach its inhabitants. With his nirvana, he has not altogether disappeared, but with a compassion as unlimited as the length of his life, he will until the end of time conjure up all kinds of messengers who will help all kinds of beings in diverse ways. Nor are Buddhas found on this earth alone, but they fill the entire universe and exist here and there everywhere, in all the world systems. According to the Mahasangikas, the conception of the Buddha as the timeless embodiment of all truth allowed for a successive revelation of that truth by him at different times and not necessarily only during his lifetime. The Mahasangikas and Mahayanists were, in a sense, mystics opposed to the rationalism of the Staviras. The difference was really one between the rational mysticism of the Mahayana and the mystical tinged rationalism of the Theravadins or Sarvastivadins. However, they had much common ground on the middle path, where their practitioners strove for emancipation. Completely contrary with the Mahasangikas, the Stavaravadin school regards the Buddha as having been an ordinary human being, despite indications to the contrary in its own Pali canon. It mentions that there is only one Bodhisattva at present, who is Maitreya. He currently resides in the Tusita heaven, from which he will be reborn in the human realm when the Dharma has died out. Eighteen sects of early Buddhism include Mahasangika, Ikavya Vaharika, Lakadaravadina, Bahasratiya, Prajantivadina, Jatavaniya, Katyusala, Aparasala, Itarasala, Kakutika, Gakulika, Aryastavira, Hemavata, Sarvastivata, Vitsibhutriya, Dharmadariya, Bidrayaniya, Samatiya, Sanagarika, Mahisasaka, Dharmagupta, Kasyupiya, and Sautrantika. This is the end of his video. Dear fellow Buddhist, just as the Buddha emphasized the importance of generosity supporting the spread of the Dharma for spiritual growth, we can cultivate this virtue in our digital age. By subscribing, liking, and sharing our channel, you're supporting the dissemination of valuable teachings, much like this Sangha was supported in the past. Your engagement accumulates positive karma for you and helps make the Dharma accessible to a wider audience, a meritorious act indeed. Let's do this with pure intentions, free from attachment and selfishness, fostering a sense of community and supporting our own spiritual journey. These principles, rooted in Buddhist ethics, continue to guide us. You will receive great blessings for supporting the propagation of Buddha's teachings in a very simple way by subscribing, liking, and sharing to help spreading the Buddha teaching to all human beings. Wishing you and your family always have a peaceful and happy life. Dear fellow Buddhist, just as the Buddha emphasized the importance of generosity supporting the spread of the Dharma for spiritual growth, we can cultivate this virtue in our digital age. By subscribing, liking, and sharing our channel, you're supporting the dissemination of valuable teachings, much like this Sangha was supported in the past. Your engagement accumulates positive karma for you and helps make the Dharma accessible to a wider audience, a meritorious act indeed. Let's do this with pure intentions, free from attachment and selfishness, fostering a sense of community and supporting our own spiritual journey. These principles, rooted in Buddhist ethics, continue to guide us. You will receive great blessings for supporting the propagation of Buddha's teachings in a very simple way. By subscribing, liking, and sharing to help spreading the Buddha teaching to all human beings. Wishing you and your family always have a peaceful and happy life.